evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. In the middle of the night, last month, Bagram Air Base, which is about 30 miles north of Kabul, plunged into darkness. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Bagram is more than an air base. It's an enormous piece of property. It's the size of a small town. It had a hospital, shops, gyms, two runways, rows of hangars and barracks. As of last month, Bagram also had a prison. It held thousands of foreign fighters, including men from ISIS and the Taliban. And then all of a sudden, for the first time in 20 years, the lights went out at Bagram. The locals understood immediately what was going on. Without warning or even a courtesy notification, the U.S. military just left, split in the middle of the night, and turned off the power as they did. Ultimately, the base's new Afghan commander fled too. And so within minutes, looters descended. They found thousands of vehicles at Bagram, hundreds of them armored, as well as a huge cache of weapons and ammunition. Now, the Pentagon didn't seem concerned. Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had explained already that, quote, Bagram is not necessary tactically for what we're going to do in Afghanistan, end quote. That turns out to be a massive miscalculation. That's now clear. The decision to abandon Bagram Airfield was, in fact, idiotic, and it led directly to the killing of 13 American servicemen yesterday. With Bagram abandoned, the evacuation of Afghanistan is being staged from a commercial airport in the capital. And given its location, Kabul's airport is almost impossible to defend. Yet, despite the fact it can't really be defended, it remains the only way for American citizens to get out of the country. As Bill Raggio, the editor of the Long War Journal, put it, abandoning Bagram Air Base, quote, is the perfect example that generals just saluting and saying, yes, sir, and can do, and not standing up and saying, this is madness, and I can't execute this because I'm putting the lives of Americans at risk, and you need to find someone else to do it. Tragically, no one in authority was brave enough to say that. Sure. Instead, at every turn, they made unwise decisions that seemed designed to make the country they serve weaker, to humiliate sure. the United States. What's interesting is that these very same people are now overseeing what may be the largest airlift in generations, an airlift of thousands of Afghan citizens into the West and into our country. So how is that airlift going? You're hearing a lot about it, but very few details. Who, example, for example, are all these Afghans, many of whom are on their way here? The truth is, despite what they are telling you, we have no real idea who they are. We just don't know. We just learned, for example, that at least 100 of the refugees the American military has flown out of Kabul, people we've been told repeatedly are heroes by definition, are in fact on terror watch lists. One man we evacuated apparently works directly for ISIS. Today, an Afghan interpreter told Fox News that this sort of thing is happening all the time. People are getting on planes in Kabul without any proof of identification whatsoever. It's like voting in California. Listen. I know people that they're in the same situation that I am right now. They have worked for the United States. They have provided supplies for the United States. But guess what? Over There are people that are getting inside the airport that they have never worked. They knew somebody with a green card. They know somebody with a mm -hmm. passport. That's how they got to mm -hmm. inside. I know people that they are inside, but they never were. So that's not an analyst on MSNBC. That's someone at the Kabul airport. And if you listen carefully, you hear a lot of stories just like that one. One pilot with United Airlines, someone who's flying people out of Kabul as part of the civilian reserve airlift fleet, just told, told Fox News he was simply told to evacuate people from Afghanistan. No details beyond that. The pilot said he was never given a passenger manifest, and that when his airplane arrived at Dulles Airport outside Washington, the State Department refused to share any passenger information with Customs and Border Patrol. They just whisked right on through. That means, as always, unnamed foreign nationals got far better treatment than you would get if you landed at Dulles Airport. Surprised? But again, there's a lot of this. Another commercial airline employee, a flight attendant, just told this show that her flight crew was told they'd be ferrying American civilians who had escaped from Kabul, and she was happy to do that. But when they arrived in Qatar in the Gulf, they learned that, in fact, they'd be carrying no American citizens at all, none. Instead, they'd have to transport Afghan nationals, many of whom became unruly on the flight. And by the way, since these weren't American citizens, they didn't have to wear masks. Rules like that are only for you and the rest of us who are paying for it. They don't apply to people without passports from Afghanistan. Now, that may shock you, but trust us, 
it's normal in Washington. The Democratic Party is actively demanding it, of course. They view every refugee as a potential new voter. You remember that Sandy Cortez was very worried about all those unvetted Trump voters wandering through what they thought was their capital on January 6th. Sandy Cortez thought she might be raped, despite the fact she wasn't even there at the time. But strangely, Cortez, so sensitive about her own safety, is not in the least concerned about sending huge and still unknown numbers of refugees into your neighborhood. She has seen, we have all seen, what Afghan might has done to Europe over the past six years, and apparently she approves of it. She wants more. In order to, to carry out and in order to make good on the role that we have played in this violence, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to make a home for the people whose lives have been upended by intervention, interventionist U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, uh, I'm, I'm proud to have co-led a letter with Representative Barbara Lee to ask the and urge the Biden administration to, um, as they set their, their refugee quotas, to make it no less than 200,000. So the macro question is, why do silly children like that have any power whatsoever in this country? Why should some girl from BU who knows nothing, has never done anything in her whole life, be in charge of the way your country looks going forward for the next 100 years. Who knows? That's democracy as we practice it. But listen carefully to what she's saying. No fewer than 200,000 refugees. Why? Because we're evil and we deserve it. Wait a second. We shouldn't have spent 20 years in Afghanistan, but why did we go there in the first place? Well, because al-Qaeda was using it as a base from which to blow up the World Trade Centers and attack the Pentagon. There was a reason we went there in the first place even if the occupation, thanks to people like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, turned out to be a total disaster. So we don't owe the country anything. They were the staging ground for 9-11. She was a child at the time, doesn't remember that. But her view now has bipartisan support in the city of Washington. It's not just Democrats, we're sad to report. Here's Republican Adam Kinzinger, for example, a man who not only weeps for Nancy Pelosi's superfans on the Capitol Hill Police Department, but also for foreign nationals on the no-fly list. They're painting Afghan refugees as invaders. You know, there are undertones even of racism here. What you see is in the media echo chamber, this fear-mongering, right? This, they're coming to your neighborhood, these hordes of people that haven't been vetted. I mean, that is not American. Refugees to this country, have always been the ones that are extremely entrepreneurial. I mean, we all know that. They come here, they work hard, they fight hard uh, to, to, for success. And so if anybody wants to go out and fear monger and continue that darkness in your heart and speaking it so you can win an election, A, you're either evil at your heart yourself, or B, you're a charlatan who's only interested in winning re-election and you truly can't say it. you care. Well, I'm going to turn it off. There's more to go. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, Tucker Carlson. But that's all I'm going to record for now. Thank you.